Okay, Hugo, uh, you've, uh, you're on the ship now, right. and, you're, and you started across. Correct. And there's, there's, there's other sh uh, ships in front of you, right? Yeah, there's just a whole flotilla of uh, LCIs and a few larger ships. They were called LSTs. And uh, we were escorted, I think, by cruisers and uh, destroyers and so on. And uh, so we landed. And until we landed, Bob, there was battleships behind us. I think the SS... Well, Nevada, Nevada, I think it was one of them. Nevada, Nevada and New Jersey, I think, was one, and the Texas. Although they had, they may have been hit at Pearl Harbor. No, no, Texas, okay. Texas, okay. Texas, okay. Then they would fire right over us, and uh, you'd hear a big whoom. And uh, just as soon as we landed, so we landed. And until we landed, Bob, there was battleships behind us. I think the SS... Well, Nevada, Nevada, I think it was one of them. Nevada, Nevada and New Jersey, I think, was one, and the Texas. Although they had, they may have been hit at Pearl Harbor. No, no, Texas, okay. Texas, okay. Then they would fire right over us, and uh, you'd hear a big whoom. And uh, just as soon as we landed, naturally all the shooting stopped, because otherwise the U.S. Navy would be shooting upon the American soldiers uh, who had just landed. And uh, then there was, luckily we were on the outside, Bob, on the right flank, and the Germans were concentrating their fire on the center of the, of the landing assault wall, of landing their crafts. So, in other words, the main assault, the September, or I think this to be the, the division, first division, would come in at the center, and we were attached to them on the right because we were artillery soldiers with guns and cannon. And over here, there was another part of the Fifth Corps on the other side. So we, these people here, caught the brunt. Okay, and that was say 20 miles inland and so forth. So we made it, and uh, we uh, first thing we did is get up against the bottom of the cliff because we're safer there. If you, we stayed out on the, on the uh, flat part, the Germans had zeroed in on that area all the time, so they were just peppering and bombarding the main force of the main brunt of the Army infantry that was landing there. Okay, so finally we, uh, I think, uh, we broke out. Well, we didn't get very far because over on the next hill, See, normally had one series of bluffs, climbed those bluffs, and it was like this for some reason. And uh, going over those bluffs, the Germans had a secondary defense, but they weren't big pillboxes like they had on the Atlantic coast. And they had a lot of mortars, a lot of machine guns, and a lot of, um, oh, 88s, 88 millimeter guns, like that gun out in front of that museum here. So if we stepped out into the open roads, they had the zeros, they had those roads covered, and they had minefields there uh, <coughs> along the roads and open fields so that the trucks went across the open fields, they hit a landmine and blow up. So we had to go very slow with our trucks and jeeps, and uh, the cannons, meantime, we had our cannoneers who were setting up their guns to fire on the Germans. I was in the supply truck, brought up ammunition to the gun emplacements. And so the guys that were pulling those cannons really are the ones that were in more danger than we were because they had already gone first. And we followed them with uh, 180, 155 millimeter artillery shells, a howitzer, 155 howitzer. So that went on inch by inch, foot by foot, yard by yard, gradually, little by little, field foot by field. And as the Army advanced, uh, the Germans kept pulling back, but they would hold uh, tight on a lot of strategic places, like up on small hills or on <coughs> the back edge of a field that was open, and they would sit in the back woods where they couldn't be seen. And it was hedgerow country, so the, the infantry had to advance very slow along the, uh, 
along the hedgerow country. And um, we didn't, believe it or not, Bob, I didn't get much action until much later on. The first action I had was when I was sent up to a, um, on a jeep, a small jeep, to get water for the guys on our crew. We had about, oh, 20 of these five-gallon water cans that I had to fill. We had a spring up there, water spring, and the Germans had it zeroed in. And just as soon as we got out of our truck and started crawling up to this place, the Germans saw us, and they started shooting us with uh, mortars. So I had to run back down the hill. It was a little spring ahead of the hillside. So we didn't get much um, action. There's our infantry action in front of us quarter of a mile up the line, they were catching hell and our tanks were getting catching hell. And so were the, uh, our own mortar roads, heavy weapons battalions and the infantrymen also. They were bringing those poor fellows in by the dozens and they took field, first aid, uh, first aid fields and they had medics there with uh, guys were getting transfusions and operated on everything else right on the middle of a grass field. So uh, we had to keep the supplies and the shells going. Every now and then an airplane, a German airplane would come over, but they'd shoot, they'd usually scare them away. We had plenty of ACAC. We didn't always have the air cover because the air cover was further down, way ahead of the, behind the German lines trying to pick out German reinforcements that were coming up, so that's where they were doing most of their shooting. So that went on in Normandy, Bob, until uh, until they got to a place right near St. Lowe, and then one particular night we got the hell bombed out. This uh, German airplanes at night, the Luftwaffe came over in their ankle bombers, H, uh, what the hell are they called? 109. Uh, Hinkles, the Hinkles, twin engine, twin engine 109s, was it, and the Ju 88s, Junkers. And boy, they really let us have it. We crawled under trucks and everything, and we had dirt go flying through the cars, through the trucks, and from the bomb blast. Just at night now, midnight. And the next morning, we were pretty well shook up, and uh, here was big trees. But you couldn't even put your arm around them. Just broken in half by bombs that had uh, hit those trees and broke them off like toothpicks. And now, how, what day was this? Now, was it uh, uh, D plus uh, one? No, or? no, no, no. It was much later, Bob. I say somewhere around. I'm gonna say somewhere around July. See that big storm. The second storm was around July 8th. Okay, let's go into the middle of July. July 15th, thereabouts. That was at the time of that big uh, uh, Falaise Gap, where thousands and thousands of Germans had been surrounded by American units all over, and pincher deal like what the Russians had done to the Germans at Stalingrad. Okay, now, we should talk about 44? Yes. Okay, well, that's right, it has to be 44. Sure. July of 1944. And uh, then there was a big gains after that, and finally the, much of the German army was trapped uh, right in here, surrounded and just absolutely brutalized and murdered. It was almost a tragic thing for humanity. So from there, we spun west and headed to Paris. And from Paris, from here to Paris, it was wide open. The Germans were retreating very, very, very uh, quickly and rapidly. Many of them had been captured, and we had one detachment after we broke out of Normandy. See, the Germans contained us in here. One detachment made a about turn and came over this way and closed the gap from here to here. Made a solid military wall with cannon and some Air Force protection and lots of defense in order to trap and hold all the German garrisons that were on Schirberg. It's the Sherbert Peninsula. There's a lot of harbors and docks in here. Well, the Americans wanted that in order that they could bring their supplies in and unload them because it was a ready-made uh, commercial harbor. So we 
uh, one part of our division was detailed to hold this area. So what the Germans did, they blew and destroyed all of these harbors, and then they surrendered. So after they surrendered, these harbors were broken up, and these Germans were taken prisoners and sent back to England. And uh, so were those over here that survived the Falise Gap. Now that's right around St. Lo, France. St. Lo was battered to the right down to stone for stone. Every single building was just knocked right out off its cement, and you couldn't even hardly walk ten feet without stepping over a half a dozen building blocks and stuff. How were the, uh, as you advanced, how did the, the, the civilians treat you? Well, there weren't too many civilians around there, Bob, because most of them had been evacuated. And uh, what had happened, you see, this area is primarily agricultural. So there weren't too many farms there. I mean, uh, there was a lot of farms and not too many houses. And the Frenchmen, they would have one house and then uh, he'd have maybe his 100 or 200 acres all around there. And uh, there were a few scattered, but most of the farmhouses had been commandeered by the German officers for command posts and for strategic observation. So they'd kick the people out. And uh, the owners had to go, heaven only knows where they went. Maybe they'd go into the woods and live there, but the German officers would live there and be bivouacked or billowetted there uh, and so forth. And uh, naturally when the Americans found out where the German strong points and headquarters are, they would throw artillery shells at them and bomb the house and burn it down. Then the German officers and the German cadre had to take an alternate position. But the civilians were, uh, and however there were some places where there was a few farm people now and then that hadn't been used by the Germans, they still had their farms there. Those poor people, they had their cows and horses all butchered and shot up because the cows would be walking around at night and any time when the Americans were on sentry duty, they'd hear something moving, they'd shout out their challenge and naturally there's no reply so they just shoot at it and next morning come to find out there's some poor cow or horse that had been uh, feeding in its, in its own pasture. And the farmers, of course, were very mad about that. And then uh, a lot of their houses would be hit, burned down to the ground. The houses were stone, but their roofs were thatched with straw. And the furniture, and then, of course, American GIs would go into these houses and loot them, steal any damn thing that they could. Everything from, who knows, they'd search for gold, money, cameras, uh, souvenirs of any sort. That was actual pilfering, and the uh, Americans did that. Wine cellars, especially Frenchmen, they get a lot of wine and cognac. So American soldiers would steal a lot of stuff like that from the German farmers. But that was mostly all very, very, very rural. Very rural, this small area. Uh, and as we ran across France, we didn't have time to stop very much because we were hard on the Germans' heels. And this kept going, got a welcome in France. People of France were kept on going real fast with huge, huge supply lines of trucks. In the meantime, this land was just getting supplies were just coming in and pouring in from England like you can't believe. Did you have any, uh, uh, at this time, any leave time? Or is it no, 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 not at all, no. It's all dirty and dusty and, and uh, the only shower we took is when it rained. <laughs> and that was, we had one hell of a big storm is somewhere about the middle of July. It rained for 48 hours. There was one, we weren't too, it was right in here. It was this, it was a follow-up rainstorm, Bob, of what we had on June the 5th, which slowed, which uh, made us postpone the, uh, the invasion for a day. But we really, really got soaked mud and then it went away, and a uh, big thunderstorm, I remember that, huge storm. And then uh, it didn't rain anymore after we broke out of St. Lowe until we got the got into the Siegfried Line there, Luxembourg, Belgium, this there, and then it rained every single day for the whole month of October without stopping. One sing not a single day of sunshine. Now, the, uh, now you, right now you're pretty close to uh, 
to Belgium, right? Yes, well, that would be Belgium uh, comes uh, somewhere in September. Uh, this we ran across here. August was uh, August the 5th, I think, was Liberation Day for Paris. And uh, we had gone through there three days before Fra uh, Paris was even officially declared safe and liberated. So we didn't, uh, we didn't get to spend any free time in France or Paris like the rear echelon soldiers did. And uh, in the meantime, we had to keep in touch with our supply columns because they were delivering us crucial supplies. Gasoline, of course, would be one. Artillery shells would be another. Uh, rations and food and uh, drinking water in cans would be the third. And then other kinds of supplies such as extra blankets, extra shoes, extra this and extra that, that had uh, priority, of, that was priority number four. Priority number one was ammunition, gasoline, medical supplies, food, water of course, because you see there's a shortage of water across there, Bob. There wasn't much water in France and uh, a lot of that water had to be brought over and I think it came over in great big uh, tanks, the same with gasoline. The Americans had put a, uh, after the beach was secured, they had strung a gas line from England right across there, right on the have you, have you heard of that word Pluto? Pluto, that was, it was called Pluto, a pipeline okay. under the ocean. Under the ocean, right. That was how you got your, your, all your gas. Right. And I don't know how we got all of our water, Bob. I never did, but all, they would, uh, they would bring it over in big uh, tank, uh, tank trucks. But we, it seems we need a lot more than what they could bring over by uh, from England because we consumed a lot of it. Uh, water was very, very scarce. We had to we had to put thiodine uh, pills in it to be sure it wasn't contaminated. And uh, the French drank wine more so than water, and they collected their rainwater uh, in barrels at the corner of their roof. And that's what they would use to feed their uh, cows and horses with. And there are sheep and goats because they had a lot of goats there for milk. And so water was a scarce item along there. That's, I think, one reason why it was so thinly populated in there because there's not enough uh, fresh water to. Um, it's interesting. You know, and also they had a well, uh, but the damn well would, would be for all the people in town. And they do everything from wash their clothes to drink it. Uh, and it was in other words, we take water for granted here, don't we? Yeah, and they would. And those damn wells, they stunk. 16 feet down, you'd, you'd smell like a cesspool, and yet the French peasant woman would be pulling a pail of water out and using it to make uh, French soup out of it. I couldn't get over that. We, could, we wouldn't uh, go near. We'd uh, wash our clothes, and we'd just we'd pull a pail of water out of there and scrub our clothes throw the water out, some of the people would say, oh, no, save it, throw it back in, with soap and uh, uh, dirty towels and everything else. Can you imagine that? I can't figure that out. Uh, and the French farmers, they stunk like hell because they never took a bath. You can smell one a mile away. We used to say, uh, when you challenge him, if he doesn't answer what he smells, leave him alone. He's a Frenchman. <laughs> Peasants, you know. And the kids, they were, you can just, uh, so they got a nickname, uh, the frogs. We used to call them the frogs because they were used to living in the marshes and dirty water, which is associated with swamps. <laughs> you know that. Can you imagine the frogs? Okay, now, now, when you're, r r let's get to uh, try the Battle of Bulge now. Oh, that didn't come until December the 15th. Yeah, there was a big, uh, okay, so we, Moved over to here, Bob, somewhere in Mel Luxembourg, Belgium, and during the month of September, we hit the Siegfried Line. That was a stalwart German defense. And by that time, the American commanders um, took real stock of the whole situation, what was going to be required to advance and penetrate into Germany, where, which divisions were going to be assigned where. Siegfried Line, in the meantime, was almost as defensive as the wall here, which meant a lot of American casualties. 
And in the meantime, troops were pouring in here from England and or from the United States to Cherbourg. And uh, our divisions were building up. And we stayed there till in September in little Belgian villages. And again, the Belgian people were ousted from their own homes. They had to move down the other side of town and double up two or three families into one house. Uh, they had to uh, give up on their little farms and discard their uh, uh, their crops and everything else. And American soldiers would stay in there. And then it began to rain uh, in about the 1st of October. And Bob, we cursed every single day that we were alive. We called it Noah's Ark because it rained cats and dogs for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, after the rain was over, we had Thanksgiving coming on. We had November. And about that time, the military commanders, they had regrouped and made all kinds of other adjustments, and they transferred me out of this, um, out of this group I was in, the 5th Corps, the 186th Field Artillery Battalion. There's supposedly a lot of surplus soldiers because our casualties in the back were not too heavy. The infantry carried the casualties, but I was an artillery man. But at the same time, many of the divisions who were fighting up against the Germans, they had suffered terrible losses. Now this is before the Battle of the Bulge. And among them was the uh, 8th Infantry Division. That's this division here. Oh, no, right here. And so we, several, the commanders of all these units that had gone across the French continent, they were given orders by the high command, the generals of each division or each army, to send any soldiers, surplus soldiers, that was called a replacement depot, repel depot, and all of the younger untrained soldiers, including me, plus many other dozens of guys, we were sent back to a town in, Bru in Brussels, Germany, Brussels, Belgium, I mean, and put into a huge replacement depot, and we were reassigned to whatever divisions that had suffered a lot of casualties, and the 8th Division was one such division. And uh, so we got assigned to that, and I was sent up to, uh, to Hurtgen, to join the 186th Field Artillery Battalion. No, no, the uh, the 8th Infantry Division, I had been sent out of the 186th, and that's the outfit I joined. We really, and they really caught hell in the uh, in battle for the Hurtgen Forest. Now, I don't know how they ever judged the ferocity of a battle bomb, but according to the Yank Magazine and Stripes Magazine, Stars and Stripes, and also to the Saturday Evening Post, they called the uh, the uh, Hurtgen Forest the worst battle of them all. And our division had suffered 80, something like 80 or 70 percent casualties there. So they were very, very low on manpower. So I was sent up to replace one of the many dead soldiers that had died in that unit. And as soon as we went up, oh, the General that uh, the general that Eighth uh, Infantry Division, by the way, General Lever, he was court-martialed and relieved because he'd done such a lousy job in fighting that battle with so many casualties. General Lever, West Point graduate, by the way, and he was replaced with uh, a younger general who was this fellow here, I think. He was replaced with this fellow. More General Mora. So. Okay, when we came up to to uh, now the Battle of, uh, of the Hurtgen Forest lasted pretty much all of November. The Americans had to take it because it's a strategic town. A little town, there's a big area there, Hurtgen, Durin, that was just south of uh, Aachen. Oh, 25, 30 miles, 40 miles, several other towns full of pillboxes and full of very, very grotesque scenes like you see here and you see here and, and that soldier there the other German soldier and the fighting here was 
very, very, very treacherous and tough. The only tough part of fighting in France occurred on the Normandy battle. After that, it was what you call pretty well distributed. Uh, not too many casualties. Casualties were within normal amount. But here in Berkeley, it was a it was a bloodshed. It was a slaughterhouse for Americans, and uh, there's huge stories told about it. I could sit here until midnight to tell you all about it. So anyway, I went up to replace, uh, uh, become a uh, cannoneer on one of the gun posts, which had taken several direct hits and half of its crew was knocked out by a German 88 gun. <coughs> so as soon as, as we were going up on a truck to be reassigned, I saw a huge column of ambulances coming down some, and they even had jeeps rigged up with stretchers hooked up on top of the jeep with a dead or a wounded soldier on top. And I saw one, the first glimpse I got, some a jeep was coming down with some poor guy laying in it on top, strapped. His foot had been cut right off here, just like in a butcher shop with an axe. Still bleeding, there was a tourniquet on him. It was snowing, it was cold. November, I said to myself, holy smokes, this is going to be one hell of a damn place they're sending me to. I remember that. And uh, we got assigned up to the uh, Battery C, 43rd Field Artillery Battalion. And that was uh, right after Thanksgiving, about November the 26th or 7th, something like that. Took the whole month of November to capture that little town of Hurtgen and the next adjoining town, which was Durin, like about as far away as from here to Cathedral City, 8th Division. Okay, Bob, so therefore, how are we doing for time now? Okay, I'd like to, because uh, we had about five minutes. So, Go ahead. So what, what, let, get, let me see, when you first realized that you were surrounded at the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, <clears throat> we weren't actually surrounded, Bob. We were fighting a front, what we call a wedge spear movement. The people in Bellstone were surrounded. That was the 101st Airborne Division. Um, we were up on, okay, the Battle of the Bulge was right about here. Moved to the side a little bit. And as the Germans advanced, we were in front of them, so we had to give way by coming up like so. As they moved, but it wasn't a straight line. It was all kinds of zigzagging and, and uh, bellying and so forth. So we got pushed up to the north east flank on the shoulder and we had to turn our guns from this direction to that direction after we got established. And uh, we had all kinds of, uh, we had to move every 48, uh, uh, every half hour even in some cases and pull our guns out because the Germans were coming. And well, where, did you, where did you spend uh, Christmas Day? By that time, the uh, <coughs> Battle of the Bulge was pretty well, I won't say solidified, but uh, they were running out of gas. This is the Germans? The Germans were. And we spent it at the city of Hurtgen, right here, Bob. Oh, wait a minute, here. Here we are, there's my Christmas Day right there. That's where I spent Christmas, in a dugout. And in a uh, in a uh, little hut that we had made out of logs, and let's see. Uh, I don't get the picture of those anyway, so. Okay. This is where we. This is where I would go up to the foreign observing point, and this was when the war ended. Christmas Day, we and New Year's Day both. Um, Okay, we spent it at Hurtgen, the city of Hurtgen, on a surrounding the Hurtgen Forest. Here I am again on Christmas Day. Christmas Day. Here's where, where, here's where, we, here's where we live, it's right in that little, that little dugout we had to make out of logs covered with moss. And um, so here again is Christmas, the, the winter. It's called the White Christmas, you go. I'll say it was white. Uh, 
Okay, you are. There's our cannon. What, 155? No, 105. 105. Light artillery was closer to the front. The reason I had it fairly safe, but not entirely in Normandy, is that we were on a 155 howitzer. That was a much bigger gun. Well, the bigger the gun was, the further okay, back we're it was. Okay, we're going to get started. ready to go. Okay. okay. Got kicked around. We had to maneuver every couple of days, if not even more often than that. We had to pull stakes, pull up our gun, and uh, retrench somewhere else, dig, dig in. About that time, we'd have a moving order again in the hard snow and ice and mud and everything. Excuse, so, excuse me, who? Can you show us? I'm going to do a. I'm going to get a close up on the map where you're talking oh, about. Oh, right in here. Um, Battle of the Bulge was in this area, right? Okay. Can you stand up against the wall? Oh, no, the other way, yeah, up the against the wall. Yeah, you behind your chair. That would be great. That's perfect. Battle of the Bulge, of course, involved um, the Ardennes Forest in uh, in Belgium, which is this area right over in here. And this area was pretty much, uh, the Germans came in on a wedge shape, sort of like this. We're on the North Bulge, right up in uh -huh. the north shoulder. And okay, they're coming out of Germany into, out of uh, Germany, what is that, way. Belgium they're coming into? Well, uh, through Belgium and uh, into, they were heading for Paris is what they were, oh, they were? theoretically trying to do. Mm -hmm. Head for Paris or somewhere in here to separate the British Army, which is to the north of us, from the American Army, which is to the south of us. Oh, okay. And that was their strategy. Of course, it was Hitler's intention to slow us down so that we wouldn't advance because he needed a little more time to uh, develop and complete the atomic bomb that he was working on. And that's the critical thing of that Belgian bulge. Oh. And there was a front which was about, 40 or about 50 miles long, which is about the same distance as the Normandy uh, beachhead was, mm -hmm. uh, roughly the same distance of miles. And uh, they advanced, and of course they started on December the 16th, as we know, which is a week for, before Christmas. And they ran into Bastogne, I, if I got my glasses. They surrounded Bastogne. Bastogne was a, a hub for the city, uh, for the invasion. It was vital that they captured Bastogne because that's where they can use Bastogne as a center point, supply depot, a replacement depot a hospital and a regrouping area. But the American paratroopers that were stationed there together with certain other, I think the 26th Division, they held it out and we know what the story was there. But we were on the fringes of it. Okay, let me see where the battle would have been. Hocken, okay, we were, okay. We were stationed right here, just below Aachen, which is right here about 50 miles south of Aachen, and that, where the pen is, is the north shoulder of the bulge. In other words, it was like that. Mm. On the top V, top V, top uh, point of the arrowhead, in other words, mm -hmm. the top shoulder of the arrowhead, right there. And we were right in that, uh, right in that area. Yes, there's Balmody right below us, where that uh, very, very infamous slaughter took place. A hundred soldiers, American soldiers, were captured there, and they were. This story goes that they tried to escape, so the Germans mowed them down, every last one of them, with one exception, one survivor, and he's the one that escaped and told the rest of the Allies what the German that massacre had done at Normandy. Did you know about it at that time? Did you the word come no, out? No, no, not yet, Bob. What we you, did. You can you can sit down. I think okay. you go. That's great. Thank you. What we did know was to watch out for German paratroopers who were dressed in American uniforms and that a lot of them spoke very good English and they were infiltrating all around trying to find out American positions, American uh, supplies, American strategy 
and of course to do what damage they could to unsuspecting American soldiers because of tremendous confusion. That I, I, I understand that even some had the put the M MP, you know, put the MP they all fans did. on and, they all did. and redirected traffic. A lot of them did that also. They that's they uh, redirected a lot of American reinforcements and sent them into a dead end so that they couldn't uh, assist the comrades that they were supposed to that the Americans were supposed to assist. And but we had a couple of them come. Uh, that we had to be very, very careful of because there was a lot of new soldiers that were being, it was like a big soup pot that was just constantly being stirred there. Our lines were not very stable, uh, Bob, and tremendous amount of confusion. Casualties, new reinforcements, reassignments. We didn't know who the hell was who, so we didn't know uh, who the hell to trust. So we had to watch out for these imposters, as they were or fakes, as they were called. Uh, one of the units nearby, they were able to tell the Germans only if uh, they ripped off his shirt and looked at his underwear. If it was German underwear, then he was a German. But <laughs> I, I understand that they also challenged with, like, you know, who's Babe Ruth and things like that. Well, that was perhaps on an extreme case, Bob, if they were very doubtful. And usually, uh, but if, if you got that close to a soldier, to a German soldier, and you had to challenge him, usually he would reveal uh, that he was uh, that he was a, uh, a, sol a German soldier before that. But uh, that was a little bit of that wasn't too frequently done. But uh, if you did challenge a soldier that much, why usually uh, it was a very uh, what's the word I'm trying to say? Pretty well established by that time that he was a uh, an enemy soldier. Because they shot him, I understand. When you, when you found him, you didn't. I don't think they did, Bob. Uh, they didn't find too many. Uh, they probably would at the time, but we didn't find any direct head-on like that to where we'd shoot him. The Americans were pretty good, and so were the Germans at taking prisoners of each side. They weren't too, except for that one massacre at Malmody. That was a. Uh, that's a real huge debatable situation in, in American military history because the Americans say that the Germans deliberately mowed them down because they didn't want to bother with them and take time to treat them as prisoners because they didn't have the Germans didn't have enough manpower that the Germans told us that a lot of Americans tried to escape and in the process of escaping they were inviting themselves to be shot just like if you're on the way from a prison guard he's going to shoot you. Yeah, but I but think uh, I think the investigation, you know, after and then after that, was. Bob, there was a lot of uh, very very thorough investigation going on, which I'm not uh, completely uh, versed on. But yeah, well, the, the, sure. the one that was responsible, uh, he was uh, he was not he was charged, but then they let him they let him out, and I think in 1950 something, last I heard. Okay, yes, and uh, his own German soldiers are the ones that uh, that identified him because the old regular German soldiers did not want to shoot American prisoners. But American intelligence officers got this particular German group after they were captured, and they asked the soldiers which officer ordered the slaughter of the Malmody, and the German soldiers said it was him. So they identified their own soldiers. Yeah, they identified him. I think what finally happened is this one, I forget what, what the colonel or whatever he was. Yeah, Colonel Vaughn something. Or and uh, they finally killed him, but they uh, somebody got to him, you know, uh, okay. uh, assassinated him. Oh, that's him. right, in this house. They sneaked into his house several years later yeah. and, and uh, shot him in his own home. Right. I guess out of revenge. Yeah, I think that's the way it well, that's what I wasn't sure. Okay, now, okay, now the battle's over with, and we have won. And uh, where were you at the at the when, when they surrendered? The, when the, the Germans the, surrendered? VE day. Where were you? VE day. Right out of right off the Elbe River, Bob. That would be right over in here. Let me have to attend it. Uh, oh, here we are. over to the left a little bit, uh, Hugh. Okay. Well, after the Battle of the Bulge was over, Bob, we advanced and we hit uh, two more main obstacles 
One was after we left our position at Hurtkin, where we had been for two months, more or less, we advanced in March because the snow began to melt and we could advance again, but it was very heavy mud. Mud all over the place. Trucks were sinking the mud up to their hubcaps. We got to the Ruhr River and the Germans made a defense there. The Ruhr River was not very wide, but it was a very swift river. So it was very difficult to manufacture or to construct uh, bridges to cross there, pontoon bridges and so on. Well, we finally made that. That was in February, the middle of February. Now we got over into the Cologne River on the city of Cologne, the Rhine River, I mean. And there again, we uh, got stopped and slowed down for a while. That was called the Rhineland. And uh, finally we crossed that. And after we crossed the Rhineland, there was just no going, no stopping us until we got up into the Elbe River, where we met the Russians on May the 10th or thereabouts. And that ended it. That was VE Day. A couple of uh, few days uh, before that, Hitler had shot himself. Excuse me, committed suicide or something. And that was uh, the end of the war. And then we waited for two months or so to come home. And we were put on this big tra troop transports and came home. And I think, Bob, here are some pictures of, of uh, well, let's see. Uh, this was the Hurricane Forest. Here was the Elbe River, the end of uh, the war in Germany. Well, you were at the Elbe River then, huh? Yes, up at the northern part, right near Lake Schwerin. Did, this was, did you get to meet any of the Russians? Yep. Got pictures of them right here, Bob. Sure do. There we are. There is a German airfield right near, right near uh, the Elbe River. The Germans destroyed their own planes when they could no longer uh, fly them, so that we wouldn't get them. There was a big bunker here, somewhere in the interior of Germany, and. German village here, German village here, American chow line. There's uh, General uh, giving us a great big pep talk here. These are duplicates. There's the pillbox where we lived when we went up into to observe to our forward observing. Broken village. There was the Cologne plane. Uh, Washing our guns down after the muddy battle. Cemetery near Liege, where a lot of our casualties were. Here's a now, now. Is this a, a cemetery or? Yeah, is that's it, a temporary cemetery. Tem though. Temporary. Yes. Right outside of Liege, Belgium. I got a couple of my buddies buried there. A fellow that got got his head blown off at uh, right near Cologne. Okay, this is the main several bridges across the Rhine River in the city of Cologne. There's that famous tower, uh, that famous cathedral, the Cologne Cathedral there. The, uh, it's got a name. The whole building was blown down except for the for the tower. Here it is again. There's a break period on a convoy as we ran across France. Now, on the way, all the way home, you, uh, uh, where, where did the ship leave? No. Uh, was it France or Hamburg? Uh, or? No, from La Havre, France. La Havre. Uh, yeah, to go back to the United States. Did you go to England first? Then no, or? no, straight across. Then we went to, uh, <coughs> uh, let's see, uh, Newport News, Virginia. In other words, you went, you went straight from, from La Havre to Newport News, huh? That's right, straight across the ocean seven days and then we got our furlough. Here's the pontoon bridge going to uh, the city of Cologne. Here we are. Here I am, Bob, in Normandy. Is that you there? That's me. Ironically, here is a uh, Here's a sergeant giving me orders to go take some men and go see if there's a sniper up in the woods because somebody reported a sniper there 
Five minutes after he gave me that order, an American truck comes running down the road, out of control, hits him and kills him. Is that right? It's not some Sergeant Axelrod. There's uh, four 50 caliber machine guns, anti-aircraft. This is, I don't know who this is, it's, that must be me on the left, Bob. Truck driver. This is cemetery. Here's our gun, Bob, 105 howitzer with a net over it. They asked about the Elbe River. This is what we saw for 48 hours after the Germans surrendered. Just big troop movements in mass, just thousands and thousands of Germans surrendering. Those old German soldiers, after they'd thrown up their hands, and the war was over. In a battered village in somewhere around Cologne. This is uh, these are all duplicates. Bomb. Here I am again. Oh, here's the airfield, which uh, these are German airplanes parked in there, but they couldn't get off the ground. I took all these pictures, Bob. Here's a big industrial center, the Krupp Works, uh, out of Cologne there. Big factories there where they manufactured all kinds of uh, war armaments. There's some American tanks. There we are in action, Bob. There's the German ME-109 parked in the forest for safety. They couldn't be seen and strafed. And uh, you saw this, you saw this. There was where the Battle of the Bulge, uh, we were up in these hillsides, Bob, and we finally had to take safety up there, and the Battle of the Bulge came out along here on that field down below. This is another part of it. It came right down that valley, Bob. There's a pontoon bridge. There's a group of guys I was with in Normandy. And the Piper Cubs. <laughs> I'm sure the base you played, And there's our gun in action in the winter. Here it is again. And here's where we spent Christmas Eve, Bob, right there. Yeah, I don't take these pictures out there. Pictures are wilted. They're getting old. Can these be preserved somehow, Bob? You know? Well, just laminate them. Laminate them. Yeah, you want to laminate them, I got the laminator. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, well, listen, that, that's right. great. I really appreciate you coming over here and doing this. Oh, okay. You've got to well. give us a lot of history. Well. And uh, it's, it's from the horse's mouth. That's yeah, it. from that's the horse's mouth. <laughs> it's very incomplete. What I'm doing, Bob, is I am writing a book word for word, page for page, day for day. It's going to be 24 chapters. I've got about six chapters done, which not only tells everything I've told you, but about 10 times more. I'm kind of sleepy-headed today. Sometime, maybe after you retire, if I could come in and just read to you, yeah. read it as I have written it, because I can read my own writing, and I bring up a lot of stuff that could never be forgotten, and uh, that I forgot now, and put that on tape. Maybe we can do that next year. Is it recording now? No, it's recording. Now it's okay. recording. And if you okay, if you okay, okay, here, okay, here's.
Where were you born? Are you on record? Is this yeah, a you're record? Tape right voice? Now. Oh, boy, the tape is right there. Well, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and I stayed there until I was two years old, and mother and dad uh, moved upstate, or not upstate, but out of the city, because dad didn't like the city. We went up to Yonkers, New York, and I graduated in, from uh, Yonkers High School, class of 1943, immediately was uh, inducted into the Army because Pearl Harbor had been hit and attacked a year and a half prior to my graduation. In other words, midway when I was a junior, none of us had heard about Hawaii, uh, except we hadn't heard about Pearl Harbor, Maine. All we knew about Hawaii was that sugar cane and pineapples came from there. And, uh, and actually the whole, uh, uh, the whole country, if certainly our area was very, very upset, shook up. And uh, the, that was on a Sunday morning, of course, December 7th, 1941. And uh, our school was, uh, our kids, we were actually very, very, very innocent about what the income and, uh, implications of war would be. Little did we know that uh, it was going to last for another four or five years. Many, many mothers were worried. A lot of uh, the general talk of the town, or the, as I would call it, the ballyhooing, was that, uh, oh, don't worry, Mrs. Tringali or Mrs. Smith or Mrs. Jones, don't worry about your son going into the Army in six months, six months, mind you, the war will be over, is what they're all saying. They should have added three more years to that, and they'd be more accurate. And, uh, of course, uh, right after graduation, we got our induction papers. The Army drafted everybody that, uh, I mean, the Army accepted everybody, but they did not draft them. Um, us, if we were still doing well in high school, they figured let let the kids finish high school. Then when they returned from the service, they wouldn't have to backtrack and uh, make up for their high school uh, deficiencies. But a lot of kids quit high school, kids that didn't like school, a lot of the dropouts as we would call them today, and uh, they joined up right away. The only uh, beauty of their volunteering would be that they would have a choice. In other words, they could choose the Army, Navy, or the um, Marines, or the Coast Guard, whereas if you were drafted, you were put where you were needed at the moment. Uh, remember now, in those days, there was no Air Force. The U.S. Army Air Corps was part of the U.S. Army. There was no differential, no uh, difference uh, as far as um, uh, Corps, or as far as forces were concerned. The Air Force was developed about 10 years later, I think when uh, air flying and uh, jets and so forth became much more technical than it was during World War II. And so anyway, we got drafted. We went to Camp Upton, Long Island, which was a couple of miles away. And we stayed there for three or four days, got outfitted out, suited up, and got a portion, got our tests, got our shots, got our exams. And uh, then I was sent to Fort Bragg, North Carolina for uh, 18 weeks basic training in field artillery and we got we were trained as uh, radio operators artillery men and um, telephone operators for forward observer and, and uh, then that was the end of basics then we were sent to Fort uh, Meade in uh, Maryland got suited up we had a 14-day furlough and uh, which was a goodbye for to the family, then we were shipped up to Camp Miles Standish in Providence, Rhode Island. We got on the ship, the SS Argentina, uh, sailed across the Atlantic, and landed in Glasgow, Scotland, and very, very, very coincidentally, that was on the very same day as today, April 1st, but 1944, it happens to be my sister's birthday, my little sister Abla's birthday, as well as April Fool's Day, of course. And uh, we landed after a 10-day convoy uh, going across the Atlantic. I got seasicker and a dog. So help me, Bob. I thought I, uh, I didn't care when I lived or died. Uh, I was so seasick I couldn't even walk around. We were on the ship for 10 days. I'd never been on a ship before, and the Atlantic Ocean was rough at the time. And uh, I crawled or figured out how to get upstairs and get some fresh air. And a uh, big storm, and I was sicker than a dog, as I mentioned. And uh, as the big storm warning came up, everybody had to go down inside in order to prevent uh, being washed overboard. And I just lay there on top of the deck, and I said, 
to hell with it. I don't care if I wash overboard. A couple of uh, medical men had to come up, carry me down. I was so damn sick and put me in the bunk. And I was so darn miserable, I didn't care whether I drowned or not. So we landed in Glasgow, Scotland at the time, on April 1st, as I mentioned. South we went uh, from Glasgow, Scotland to on a train. The trains were very, very, very uh, scarce because Britain had been bombed by the Luftwaffe, of course, and also the stations had been damaged and the trains were small. They had huge problems with supplies and uh, they shipped us down to a little place in uh, Camp St. Audrey, which would be right, I need a pencil, Bob, if you have a pencil uh, or a pen, uh, they, which would be on a train coming south. They shipped us right up here to right about where my pen point is, I said, at the end of the Bay of Bristol. Uh, we could see Cardiff, Wales across the way, Taunton, and um, coming down on the train, that, believe it or not, they ran out of train cars, troop trains, so they put us on, of all things, a cattle car, if you could believe it, there's about 25 of us, because that's all they had room for. They utilized and uh, were so crippy with every single ounce of uh, space that they could have, because they were really hard pressed, the British were. And on the other side of the train, of the, of the car, believe it or not, they had a bunch of cattle that were heading south from Scotland, Scotch beef cattle, as was very famous. And they were heading down into the same area to Taunton to go to the slaughterhouse. And so we were on the other side, we took our sleeping bags and lay down on the straw. There was a, a barricade, a wooden barricade that had been built across that, the midway across the car, and the cows were on one side, and about 24, 25 of us were laying on the, so on the straw on the other side. And it was a one-night trip going south. Uh, we were given our dinner uh, when we got off the boat at the big station at the uh, debarkation point. There wasn't much of there. It was Army K rations. And down we went. And believe it or not, the trains were jolting along. And that wooden barricade broke. And the cattle got loose. And they started walking all over around us. Damn near stepped out a bunch of us. So we crawled out of our sleeping bags. And we stood up. I guess it was 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, heaven only knows when. And we just uh, stood up straight and uh, for the rest of the ride as we headed south until we pulled into into the big uh, freight yard railroad station there at the, uh, out of Taunton. And then uh, we got off the train, a bunch of us were marshaled over and we, we joined our outfit, which was the 5th Corps, 186th Field Artillery Battalion. Did you travel in battle gear? Or did you pick that up later? No, no, we picked that up down at the camp, Bob. We were tra not across, the, coming over on the boat, we had what is known as our um, duffel bags. And in our duffel bag, we had a sleeping bag, we had a knapsack, we had canteens, the, the metal mess kits, because we were served with our own, uh, we, at the different uh, posts for food, we, were, we had to carry our own mess kit. And uh, our water cask, of course, our water casket, and uh, extra clothes, extra socks, extra shoes, which was always necessary, and extra, and a sleeping bag, or was it a bedroll? I can't remember which. I think it was a bedroll. Uh, I think that's about it. I don't remember, but we had a whole and uh, extra wool clothes. We had the the old, uh, the new army duffel bags, which has the metal buckle on them and a lack of carrying handle, whereas while we were training in the Fort Bragg, we had the old Army duffel bags, which had the drawstring. They were colored tan, the color of this. And everybody had the same thing, like a checklist. Yes. In other yeah, words, you would have well. probably inspection to be sure that everybody didn't have excess baggage. Oh, and we got all of that on uh, at Camp Miles Standish in Providence, Rhode Island, and uh, that was all issued. There was. Uh, it was a standard procedure for all the soldiers going overseas to get all of these different things issued and carry it with them uh, on the boat and on over to their uh, to their new destination. And I think I'm only guessing, but with the common sense, it makes sense that very maneuver or that very activity saved the U.S. Army quartermaster a lot of labor because it means they would have had to ship all this 
huge tonnage of stuff all over to England, unload it, deposit it, reissue it, reroute it, whereas this way, they had a couple of million soldiers carry a big bulk of it over for the, for the army. Oh, the right size, right? Yeah, they were giving us the right size, of course. So therefore, instead of the army sending over two million blankets to depot XYZ and then having to a portion out to there, they'd have to they'd send two million less blankets out if each soldier carried one. Like, and that's why we had the duffel bag. It made sense. It made sense because it eliminated labor and um, and rehandling and warehousing it, reissuing it, and all the personnel that was required to to do that job. So that was their purpose. So we were the, uh, let's call it, we were the uh, the workhorses <laughs> for the but, quartermaster corps. But, but what 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 year and what month would, would this be? Well, as I said, I landed in Scotland April 1st, 1944. And as I said today, this very day, by coincidence, but of course, uh, 40. Uh, as, what is it, 46 years ago? Is so everybody ago. aware that, that there was to be an invasion of Europe? Well, we knew it was going to happen. They didn't even call it the invasion. They called it the big shove-off. And uh, they, we were all aware of it. We didn't know when, and we didn't know where, and we didn't know how many of us were going to go in, and how many of us were going to stay back, and uh, how many of us uh, would be assigned to what section of the, uh, of, uh, the army, the this code of all of this, I should say, the strategy, was very, very, very top secret. Uh, they, we knew about as much then as a, as a hog knows about a slaughterhouse until he gets the final axe. So that's, um, there was, oh, six million soldiers in England involved at the time before the shove off. Maybe my number is wrong. No, no, I'll take that back, Bob. It was not six million, it was two million. Two million soldiers waiting on that island, largely on the southern part of it, but many of them in, in London as well, but also along a tremendous amount along the sea coasts, all along here and in here, and of course London, and over there by uh, Dover, that was the Air Force actually, and uh, your B-17 flying fields as well as your Thunderbolts and your Mustang fields were over there as well and lightnings, I suppose, be P-38s. It's quite a, quite a huge... Now, there was, uh, they were supposed to uh, shove off uh, a few, couple of days before. One day, Bob. One day? There was a lot of talk about shoving off June the 4th and or the 5th, but a big, huge storm was raging at that time. And the storm continued on to June the 6th. But the weather report for the RAF, the Royal Air Force, uh, told Eisenhower and his top, top, very top secret advisors, including General Montgomery, that there's a possible break in that storm. And uh, because the storm would come and go and disappear very, very quickly, and Eisenhower took a gamble and said, OK, it'll be great to uh, land on June the 6th, because if we waited another month, Ju July 6th, the tides, the tides and the moon, now. and also would have given the Germans a double advantage. It would give them more time to shore up their defenses and bolster the defenses, plus it would have given their spies more time to try to figure out where we were going to land. So uh, if we had waited another month, it would have been pretty tough. And also it would have given us less time to cross France and get into uh, into the Siegfried line of Belgium. And that might very well have given Hitler more time to not only stall us, but more time to hold off the Russians on the Eastern Front. Because don't forget, Hitler was fighting a two-sided battle, the Russians on the East and the Americans on the West. And uh, consequently, uh, if he had more time to spare here, he could have fought the Russians off and held them further back or slowed down their advance by one month's time because he had a lot of divisions that were um, poised to hold off the Russians and he had to take divisions away from Russia in order to uh, 
confront the Americans when they landed. Yeah, how, how did you feel, and how did you know that land showed off was imminent, and, uh, and you, you knew what was going to happen? We didn't know what was really going to happen, Bob, in a sense, because, as I say, we were kept ignorant and dumb, and it was deliberately and purposefully some of the officers even had a slight idea, but most of them were kept in the dark. They didn't know what the heck was uh, what was really going on. Most of our junior officers, that means lieutenants and captains, they we'd have a beer with them or drink with them uh, up until the night before. They were carousing around with their last-minute girlfriends and all that. They had no idea what the hell was going to be either. Not until the final orders came to mount up, as they said get on the trucks, and then we were driven down to our barges uh, waiting for us on the shore, on the, uh, the Bristol Bay there, and, uh, and away we went. And uh, that was down here. We shoved off from somewhere down in here, Southampton, Poole, Taunton. But this is where we were stationed, so we got off the trucks and we headed south by the thousands. There's a big, huge marshalling area down there. Uh, American soldiers were confined, as I say, two million within that chunk of England there. If the Luftwaffe was still functioning, they could have bombed the hell out of us and caught us all right there. But of course, the Luftwaffe had been knocked out, and we had plenty of air power overhead to be sure that no German planes would sneak in from the coast and bomb us. They knew they were there, but there's nothing they could do about it until getting out. On the um, on the uh, LCIs, uh, is that what you were on? Was LCI? Yeah, it held about a hundred a hundred soldiers, give or take a few, Bob, maybe ninety, not more than that. But LC is uh, landing, landing craft, craft infantry. infantry. Okay, yeah, that's the one that the drops big the ramp. Yeah, and they carried maybe could carry up to two trucks, two army trucks, included now on the army trucks. It was loaded with, one truck was loaded with uh, food, water, jerry can water, and um, medical supplies. The other truck was loaded with um, ammunition and gasoline, because those two items were very, very, very vital at the point of uh, landing. And uh, it was calculated that that would be enough to suffice us until the big supply units arrived, but they had to be uh, held back, postponed, until the beach was secure. Because you can't start loading thousands of gallons of gasoline and ammo if the beach isn't even secure. So we had to go in on what we call limited provisions, with the understanding that the beach would be taken, and then the big supplies could come in without being interfered or interrupted or being lost or being otherwise destroyed. Are, are you familiar with a with uh, name Mulberry? It's a floating oh, harbor. I've heard of it, Bob, but I can't place it. Mulberry, Mulberry, Mulberry. It was like a floating harbor. They, they, they oh, yes, yeah, sure, sure, sure. That came in several days after the landing. Yeah, they didn't bring Mulberry in right away, but they got, they had it all um, uh, designed and prepared in piecemeal and in parts. And uh, Mulberry was um, was uh, implanted or uh, placed there several days uh, again after the beach was safe. Because if it was not safe, the Germans could have bombarded the hell out of it and destroyed it, and that'd be the end of it. So we had to go inland, and we had to knock out all those shore guns so that they couldn't shoot at Mulberry and destroy it and sink it. That it was do, about. Do, a, do you recall what wave you were in? I don't think they went by waves, Bob. Uh, it was just, you see, there was four four units that landed. And I don't think they had it by waves. They just had a huge mass flotation of, uh, Continual. of uh, continual uh, ships, one behind the other. And if one blew up uh, or got hit a, mine, hit a mine or something, uh, there'd be dozens more right alongside of it. So I don't think it was like the Marines where they would discharge them in Okinawa and then send the empty ships back to to uh, 
the main uh, troop ship and load up again. See, a lot of people don't know this. Um, it's a good, good, good thing you brought, you know, you brought that out. Yeah, the U.S. Marines in the Pacific had waves, but the uh, United States didn't have waves. We had just what we call a con uh, just one complete um, congregation of ships. They all landed pretty much at the same time. Now, that's not to say that the ships, the empty ships that returned, they would pick up more soldiers, but they didn't land until the next day because they had to stake a good day across the channel, uh, which was at that point uh, about 100 miles wide. See, at this point, the narrowest point right here is, only, is 35. You stand, stand, but this, stand, stand up against the wall so you can think like this. There you go. Yeah, this point here is more like 100 miles, but this part, we didn't go this way. This is from Calais to Dover. And uh, so the ships had to unload, and that took a little time, the landing craft, and came back. And then we met many ships coming in. The only thing these ships would do, they'd wait a little bit, and if they could get a lot of wounded soldiers, they would pick up wounded soldiers along the beach, load them up, and take them back to the hospital in England, but that they wouldn't arrive there for maybe a couple hours later. So, so no, you, you land at Omaha? Yeah, Omaha is this strip right here. Uh, Omaha and Utah Beach would be this one over here, and over here, Juneau Beach would be where the British and uh, Canadian forces landed. This uh, Omaha would be the main portion of where the Americans landed. There was three divisions plus a corps. The three divisions that landed at Omaha was the 1st Infantry Division, the 4th, uh, excuse me, the 1st Infantry Division, the 5th Corps, which was us, I was in the 5th Corps, and I was in that artillery, uh, uh, what do you call it, Supp um, support group, big group, 155 millimeter houses. And the 4th Division landed over there at Utah Beach, that's where the big cliffs were. That's where they had to scale the cliffs. They'd fire uh, hooks grappling up into hooks. the air, grappling hooks, and then pull themselves up with ropes or else with extension ladders. And there, some of those cliffs were 200 feet high. That was the 4th Infantry Division under a Texas Ranger commander whose last name was Rudder, Colonel Rudder. And on that initial assault in Utah Beach, there was um, Oh, I think 600 men who undertook that scale or that assault, and only 200 lived. And there's a big memorial, a big bronze memorial at that point, Point Huac uh, Hoc de, oh, what's it, Point Huc, Hoc something, with big memorial statue with all the names of the fellows that died there. And Colonel Rudder, he was from Texas, at Texas. Ranger group. And then the, uh, oh yes, and going back to Normandy, you, Omaha Beach was the first division, was the uh, fifth corps that I was in, and the 29th division. We'll probably have to cut it here, okay? Start sure, Bob. Now, they we're going to do the, we're going to finish. He's going to do a little oh. ground school there. Well, what, you want me to continue to talk, Bob? No, no, not. Okay, Hugo, uh, you've, uh, you're on the ship now, and, right. you're, and you started across. Correct. And, and there's, there's, there's other sh uh, there's ships in front of you, right? Yeah, there's just a whole flotilla of uh, LCIs and a few larger ships. They were called LSTs. And uh, we were escorted, I think, by cruisers and uh, destroyers and so on. And uh, so we landed. And until we landed, Bob, there was battleships behind us. I think the SS... Well, Nevada, Nevada, I think it was one of one. Nevada, Nevada. And New Jersey, I think, was one, and the Texas. Although they had, they may have been hit at Pearl Harbor. No, no, Texas was okay. Texas, okay. Then they would fire right over us, and uh, you'd hear a big whoom. And uh, just as soon as we landed, naturally all the shooting stopped, because otherwise the U.S. Navy would be 
shooting upon the American soldiers uh, who had just landed. And uh, then there was, luckily we were on the outside, Bob, on the right flank, and the Germans were concentrating their fire on the center of the of the landing assault wall, of landing the crafts. So, in other words, the main assault, the September, or not, just to me, the, the division, the first division, would come in at the center, and we were attached to them on the right because we were artillery soldiers with guns and cannon. And over here, there was another part of the Fifth Corps on the other side. So we, these people here caught the brunt. Okay, and that was, say, 20 miles inland and so forth. So we made it, and uh, we, uh, first thing we did is get up against the bottom of the cliff, because we're safer there. If you, we stayed out on the, on the uh, flat part, the Germans had zeroed in on that area all the time, so they were just peppering and bombarding the main force or the main brunt of the army infantry that was landing there. Okay, so finally we, uh, I think uh, we broke out, but well, we didn't get very far because over on the next hill, see normally had one series of bluffs, climbed those bluffs, and it was like this for some reason. And uh, going over those bluffs, the Germans had a secondary defense, but they weren't big pillboxes like they had on the Atlantic coast. And they had a lot of mortars, a lot of machine guns, and a lot of, um, Oh, 88s, 88 millimeter guns, like that gun out in front of the museum here. So if we stepped out into the open roads, they had the zeros, they had those roads covered, and they had minefields there uh, <coughs> along the roads and open fields so that the trucks went across the open fields, they hit a landmine and blow up. So we had to go very slow with our trucks and jeeps and uh, the cannons, meantime, we had our cannoneers who were setting up their guns to fire on the Germans. I was in the supply truck, brought up ammunition to the gun emplacements. And so the guys that were pulling those cannons really are the ones that were in more danger than we were because they had already gone first. And we followed them with uh, 180, 155 millimeter artillery shells. Howitzer, 155 Howitzer. So that went on inch by inch, foot by foot, yard by yard, gradually, little by little, field foot by field. And as the Army advanced, uh, the Germans kept pulling back, but they would hold uh, tight on a lot of strategic places, like up on small hills or on the back edge of a field that was open they would sit in the back woods where they couldn't be seen, and it was hedgerow country, so the, the infantry had to advance very slow along the, uh, along the hedgerow country. And um, we didn't, believe it or not, Bob, I didn't get much action until much later on. The first action I had was when I was sent up to a, uh, on a jeep, a small jeep, to get water for the guys on our crew. We had about Oh, 20 of these five-gallon water cans that I had to fill. We had a spring up there, water spring, and the Germans had it zeroed in. And just as soon as we got out of our truck and started crawling up to this place, the Germans saw us, and they started shooting us with uh, mortars. So I had to run back down the hill. It was a little spring halfway up the hillside. So we didn't get much... Um, Action, there's our infantry action in front of us, a quarter of a mile up the line. They were catching hell, and our tanks were getting catching hell. And so were the uh, our own mortar, uh, heavy weapons battalions, and the infantrymen also. They were bringing those poor fellows in by the dozens, and they took field first aid, uh, first aid fields, and they had medics there with uh, guys were getting transfusions and operated on everything else right out in the middle of a grass field. So uh, we had to keep
keep the supplies and the shells going. Every now and then an airplane, a German airplane would come over, but they'd shoot, they'd usually scare them away. We had plenty of ACAG. We didn't always have the air cover because the air cover was further down, way ahead of the, behind the German lines, trying to pick out German reinforcements that were coming up. So that's where they were doing most of their shooting. So that went on in Normandy, Bob, until the uh, so they got to a place right near St. Lowe, and then one particular night we got the hell bombed out. This uh, German airplanes at night, the Luftwaffe came over in their Enkel bombers, H, uh, what the hell are they called? 109. Uh, the Enkel? The Henkels. Twin engine? Twin engine 109s, was it? The, and the Ju 88s, Junkers. And boy, they really let us have it. We, crawled under trucks and everything, and we'd have dirt go flying through the cars, through the trucks, and from the bomb blast, just at night now, midnight. And the next morning we were pretty well shook up, and uh, here was big trees, but you couldn't even put your arm around them, just broken in half by bombs that had uh, hit those trees and broke them off like toothpicks. And you know, how, what day was this now? Was it, uh uh, D plus uh, one? No, 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 no. It was much later, Bob. I say somewhere around, I'm going to say somewhere around July. See that big storm? The second storm was around July 8th. Okay, let's go into the middle of July, July 15th, thereabouts. And that was at the time of that big uh, uh, fillet scap where thousands and thousands of Germans had been surrounded by American units all over and pincher a deal like what the Russians had done to the Germans at Stalingrad. Okay, now, we still talking about 44? Yes. Okay, well, that's right, it has to be 44. Sure. July of 1944. And uh, then there was a big gains after that. And finally, the, much of the German army was trapped uh, right in here, surrounded and just absolutely brutalized and murdered. It was almost a tragic thing for humanity. So from there, we spun west and headed for Paris. And from Paris, from here to Paris, it was wide open. The Germans were retreating very, very, very uh, quickly and rapidly. Many of them had been captured. And we had one detachment after we broke out of Normandy, see the Germans contained us in here. One detachment made a about turn and came over this way and closed the gap from here to here. Made a solid military wall with cannon and some Air Force protection and lots of defense in order to trap and hold all the German garrisons that were on Cherbourg. It's the Cherbourg Peninsula. Now, there's a lot of harbors and docks in here. Well, the Americans wanted that in order that they can bring their supplies in and unload them because it was a ready-made uh, commercial harbor. So we, uh, one part of our division was detailed to hold this area. So what the Germans did, they grew and destroyed all these harbors and then they surrendered. So after they surrendered, these harbors were broken up and these Germans were taken prisoners and sent back to England. And uh, so were those over here that survived the Felice Gap. Now that's right around St. Lowe, France. St. Lowe was battered to the right down to stone for stone. Every single building was just knocked right out of, off its cement. And you couldn't even hardly walk 10 feet without stepping over a half a dozen building blocks and stuff. How were the, uh, as you advanced, how did the, the, the civilians treat you? Well, there weren't too many civilians around there, Bob, because most of them had been evacuated. And uh, what had happened, you see, this area is primarily agricultural. So there weren't too many farms there. I mean, uh, there was a lot of farms and not too many houses. And the Frenchmen, they would have one house, and then uh, he'd have maybe his 100 or 200 acres all around there. and. Uh, there were a few scattered, but most of the farmhouses had been commandeered 
by the German officers for command posts and for strategic observation. So they kicked the people out. And uh, the owners had to go, heaven only knows where they went. Maybe they'd go into the woods and live there, but the German uh, officers would live there and be bivouacked or billowetted there uh, and so forth. And uh, naturally, when the Americans found out where the German strong points and headquarters are, they would throw artillery shells at them and bomb the house and burn it down. Then the German officers and the German cadre had to take an alternate position. But the civilians were, uh, and however, there were some places where there was a few farm people down and that hadn't been used by the Germans. They still had their farms there. Those poor people, they had their cows and horses all butchered and shot up because the cows would be walking around at night and any time when the Americans were on sentry duty, they'd hear something moving, they'd shout out their challenge and naturally there's no reply so they just shoot at it and next morning come to find out it was some poor cow or horse that had been uh, feeding in its, in its own pasture. And the farmers, of course, were very mad about that and then uh, a lot of their houses would be hit, burned down to the ground. The houses were stone, but their roofs were thatched with straw and the furniture. And then, of course, American GIs would go into these houses and loot them, steal any damn thing that they could. Everything from, who knows, they'd search for gold, money, cameras, uh, souvenirs of any sort. That was actual pilfering. And they, uh, Americans did that. Wine cellars, especially Frenchmen, they get a lot of wine and cognac. So American soldiers would steal a lot of stuff like that from the German farmers. But that was mostly all very, very, very rural. Very rural, this whole area. Uh, and as we went across France, we didn't have time to stop very much because we were hard on the Germans' heels. And this kept going, got a welcome in France. People of France, we kept on going real fast with huge, huge supply lines of trucks. In the meantime, this land was just getting supplies were just coming in and pouring in from England like you can't believe. Did you have any uh, uh, at this time any leave time or no? No, oh, never. no, no not at all. No, it's all dirty and dusty, and, and uh, the only shower we took is when it rained. <laughs> And that was, we had one hell of a big storm it was somewhere about the middle of July. It rained for 48 hours. There was one, we weren't too, it was right in here. It was this, it was a follow up rainstorm, Bob, of what we had on June the 5th, which slowed, which uh, made us postpone the, uh, the invasion for a day. But we really, really got soaked in mud, and then it went away, and a uh, big thunderstorm, I remember that, huge storm. And then uh, it didn't rain anymore after we broke out of St. Lowe until we got the got into the Siegfried Line there, Luxembourg, Belgium, this there, and then it rained every single day for the whole month of October without stopping. One sing not a single day of sunshine. Now then now you right now you're pretty close to uh, to Belgium, right? Yes, well that would be Belgium uh, comes uh, somewhere in September. Uh, this we ran across here. August was uh, August the fifth, I think, was Liberation Day for Paris, and uh, we had gone through there three days before Fra uh, Paris was even officially declared safe and liberated. So we didn't uh, we didn't get to spend any free time in France or Paris like the rear echelon soldiers did. And uh, in the meantime, we had to keep in touch with our supply columns because they were delivering us crucial supplies. Gasoline, of course, would be one. Artillery shells would be another. Uh, rations and food and uh, drinking water in cans would be the third. And then other kinds of supplies such as extra blankets, extra shoes, extra this and extra that. That had uh, priority, uh, that was priority number four. Priority number one was ammunition, gasoline, medical supplies, food, water of course, because you see there's a shortage of water across there, Bob. There wasn't much water in France and uh, a lot of that water had to be 
brought over, and I think it came over in great big uh, tanks, the same with gasoline. The Americans had put a, uh, after the beach was secured, they had strung a gas line from England right across there, right on the beach. Have, have you heard of that word, Pluto? Pluto, that was, it was called Pluto, a pipeline okay. under the ocean. Under the ocean, right. That was how you got your, your, all your gas. Right. And I don't know how we got all of our water, Bob. I never did, but all, they would come, they would bring it over in big uh, tank, uh, tank trucks. But we, it seems we need a lot more than what they could bring over by, uh, from England because we consumed a lot of it. Uh, water was very, very scarce. We had to, we had to put thiodine uh, pills in it to be sure we, it wasn't contaminated. And uh, the French drank wine more so than water, and they collected their rainwater uh, in barrels at the corner of their roof. And that's what they would use to feed their uh, cows and horses with, and their sheep and goats, because they had a lot of goats there for milk. And so water was a scarce item along there. That's, I think, one reason why it was so thinly populated in there, because there's not enough uh, fresh water to, uh, interesting. you know, and also, they had a well, uh, but the damn well would, would be for all the people in town, and they'd do everything from wash their clothes to drink it. Uh, and it was, in other words, we take water for granted here, don't we? Yeah, them. and they would, and those damn wells, they stunk. If 16 feet down, you'd, you'd smell like a cesspool, and yet the French peasant woman would be pulling a pail of water out and using it to make uh, French soup out of it. I couldn't get over that. We, could, we wouldn't uh, go near, we'd uh, wash our clothes and we'd just we'd pull a bale of water out of there and scrub our clothes, throw the water out. Some of the people would say, oh, no, save it, throw it back in with soap and uh, our dirty towels and everything else. Can you imagine that? I can't figure that out. Uh, and the French farmers, they stunk like hell because they never took a bath. You can smell one a mile away. We used to say, uh, when you challenge him, if he doesn't answer what he smells, leave him alone. He's a Frenchman. <laughs> Fat peasants, you know. And the kids, they were, you can just, uh, so they got a nickname, uh, the frogs. We used to call them the frogs because they were used to living in the marshes and dirty water, which is associated with swamps. <laughs> you know that. Can you imagine the frogs? Okay, now, now when you're, Let's get to uh, right. the Battle of Bulge now. Oh, that didn't come until December the 15th. Yeah, there was a big... Uh... Okay, so we moved over to here, Bob, somewhere in Mel Luxembourg, Belgium, and during the month of September, we hit the Siegfried Line. That was a stalwart German defense. And by that time, the American commanders um, took real stock of the whole situation, what was going to be to advance and penetrate into Germany, where, which divisions were going to be assigned where. Siegfried Line, in the meantime, was almost as defensive as the wall here, which meant a lot of American casualties. And in the meantime, troops were pouring in here from England and or from the United States to Cherbourg. And uh, our divisions were building up. And we stayed there till in September in little Belgian villages. And again, the Belgian people were ousted from their own homes. They had to move down the other side of town and double up two or three families into one house. Uh, they had to uh, give up on their little farms and discard their, uh, uh, their crops and everything else. And American soldiers would stay in there. And then it began to rain uh, in about the 1st of October. And Bob, we cursed every single day that we were alive. We called it Noah's Ark because it rained cats and dogs for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, after the rain was over, we had Thanksgiving coming on. We had November. About that time, the military commanders, they had regrouped and made all kinds of other adjustments. And they transferred me out of this... Um, out of this group I was in, the 5th Corps, the 186th Field Artillery Battalion, there's supposedly a lot of surplus soldiers because our casualties in the back were not too heavy. 
the infantry carried the casualties, but I was an artillery man. But at the same time, many of the divisions who were fighting up against the Germans, they had suffered terrible losses. Now this is before the Battle of the Bulge. And among them was the uh, 8th Infantry Division. That's this division here. Oh, right here. And so we, several, the commanders of all these units that had gone across the French continent, they were given orders by the high command, the generals of each division or each army, to send any soldiers, surplus soldiers, that was called a replacement depot, repel depot, and all of the younger untrained soldiers, including me, plus many other dozens of guys, we were sent back to a town in, Bru in Brussels, Germany, Brussels, Belgium, I mean, and put into a huge replacement depot, and we were reassigned to whatever divisions that had suffered a lot of casualties. And the 8th Division was one such division. And um, so we got assigned to that, and I was sent up to, uh, to Hurtgen to join the 186th Field Artillery Battalion. Well, no, no, the, uh, the 8th Infantry Division, I had been sent out of the 186th. And that's the outfit I joined. We really, and they really caught hell in the uh, in battle for the Hurtgen Forest. Now, I don't know how they ever judged the ferocity of a battle bomb, but according to the Yank magazine and Stripes magazine, the Stars and Stripes, and also the Saturday Evening Post, they called the, uh, the uh, Hurtgen Forest the worst battle of them all. And our division had suffered 80 something like 80 or 70 percent casualties there. So they were very, very low on manpower. So I was sent up to replace one of the many dead soldiers that had died in that unit. And as soon as we went up, oh, the general that, uh, the general that uh, 8th Infantry Division, by the way, General Weaver, he was court-martialed and relieved because he'd done such a lousy job in fighting that battle with so many casualties, General Weaver, West Point graduate, by the way. And he was replaced with uh, a younger general who was this fellow here, I think. He was replaced with this fellow. More General Morrow. So, okay, when we came up to, to uh, now the Battle of, um, of the Hurtgen Forest lasted pretty much all of November. Americans had to take it because it's a strategic town. A little town, there's a big area there, Hurtgen, Durin, it was just south of uh, Aachen, oh, 25, 30 miles, 40 miles, several other towns, full of pillboxes and full of very, very grotesque scenes like you see here, and you see here. And, and that soldier there, the other American German soldier. And the fighting here was very, very, very treacherous and tough. The only tough part of the fighting in France occurred on the Normandy battle. After that, it was what you call pretty well distributed. Uh, not too many casualties. Casualties were within normal amount. But here in Berkman, it was a it was a bloodshed. It was a slaughterhouse for Americans. And uh, there's huge stories told about it. I can sit here until midnight to tell you all about it. So anyway, I went up to replace, uh, uh, become a uh, cannoneer on one of the gun posts, which had taken several direct hits, and half of its crew was knocked out by a German 88 gun. <coughs> so as soon as, as we were going up on a truck to be reassigned, I saw a huge column of ambulances coming down. Some, and they even had jeeps rigged up with stretchers hooked up on top of the jeep with a dead or a wounded soldier on top. And I saw one of the first glimpses I got. Some jeep was coming down with some poor guy laying in it on top, strapped. His foot had been cut right off here, just like in a butcher shop with an axe. Still bleeding, there was a 20 cut on him. It was snowing, it was cold. 
November, I said to myself, holy smokes, this is going to be one hell of a damn place they're sending me to. I remember that. And uh, we got assigned up to the uh, Battery C, 43rd Field Artillery Battalion. And that was uh, right after Thanksgiving, about November the 26th or 7th, something like that. Took the whole month of November to capture that little town of Hurtgen. And the next adjoining town, which is Durin, like about as far away as from here to Cathedral City, 8th Division. Okay, Bob, so therefore, how are we doing for time now? Okay, I'd like to, because uh, we had about five minutes. So, Go ahead. So what, 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 let, get, let me see, when you first realized that you were surrounded at the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, <clears throat> we weren't actually surrounded, Bob. We were fighting a front, what we call a wedge spear movement. The people in Bellstone were surrounded. That was the 101st Airborne Division. Uh, we were up on. Okay, the Battle of the Bulge was right about here. Move to the side a little bit. And as the Germans advanced, we were in front of them, so we had to give way by coming up like so. As they moved, but it wasn't a straight line. It was all kinds of zigzagging and, and uh, bellying and so forth. So we got pushed up to the north east flank on the shoulder and we had to turn our guns from this direction to that direction after we got established. And uh, we had all kinds of, uh, we had to move every 48, uh, every half hour even in some cases and pull our guns out because the Germans were coming. And where, did, where did you spend uh, Christmas Day? By that time, the uh, <coughs> Battle of the Bulge was pretty well, I won't say solidified, but uh, they were running out of gas. This is the Germans? The Germans were. And we spent it at the city of Hurtgen, right here. Bob. Oh, wait a minute, here. Here we are, there's my Christmas Day right there. That's where I spent Christmas, in a dugout. And in a uh, in a uh, little hut that we had made out of logs, and let's see. Uh, I talked to him to the picture of those anyway. So okay. This is where we. This is where I would go up to the foreign observing point, and this was when the war ended. Christmas Day, we and New Year's Day both. Um, Okay, we spent it at Hurtgen, the city of Hurtgen, on a, surrounding the Hurtgen Forest. Here I am again on Christmas Day. Christmas Day. Here's what. Here's what. To be. Here's where we live. Right in that little, that little dugout we had to make out of logs covered with moss. And um, so here again is Christmas, the, the winter. It's called the White Christmas. You go. I'll say it was white. Uh, there you are. There's our cannon. What, 155? No, 105. 105. Light artillery was closer to the front. The reason I had it fairly safe, but not entirely in Normandy, is that we were on a 155 howitzer. That was a much bigger gun. Well, the bigger the gun was, the further okay, back we're it was. Okay, going to get started. Ready to go. Okay. okay. A couple of days, if not even more often than that, we had to pull stakes, pull up our gun, and uh, retrench somewhere else, dig, dig in. About that time, we'd have a moving order again in the hard snow and ice and mud and everything. Excuse, so, excuse me, who? Can you show us? I'm going to do a. I'm going to get a close up on the map where you're talking oh, about. Oh, right in here. Battle of the Bulge was in this area, right? Okay. Can That's you stand up against the wall? Oh, no, the other way, yeah, up against the wall. Yeah, you behind your chair. Before. That would be great. That's perfect. Battle of the Bulge, of course, involved um, the Ardennes Forest in uh, in Belgium, which is this area right over in here. And this area was pretty much uh, the Germans came in 
on a wedge shape, sort of like this. We're on the north bulge, right up in uh -huh. the north shoulder. And okay, they're coming out of Germany into, uh, Germany, what is that, way. Belgium they're coming into? Well, uh, through Belgium and uh, into, they were heading for Paris is what they were. Oh, they were? Theoretically trying to do. Mm -hmm. Head for Paris or somewhere in here to separate the British Army, which is to the north of us, from the American Army, which is to the south of us. Oh, okay. And that was their strategy. Of course, it was Hitler's intention to slow us down so that we wouldn't advance because he needed a little more time to uh, develop and complete the atomic bomb that he was working on. And that's the critical thing of that Belgian bulge. Oh. And there was a front which is about 40, or f about 50 miles long, which is about the same distance as the Normandy uh, beachhead was, mm -hmm. uh, roughly the same distance of miles. And uh, they advanced, and of course they started on December the 16th, as we know, which is a week for, before Christmas. And they ran into Bastogne, I, if I got my glasses. They surrounded Bastogne. Bastogne was a, a hub for the city, uh, for the invasion. It was vital that they captured Bastogne because that's where they can use Bastogne as a center point, supply depot, a replacement depot, a hospital, and a regrouping area. But the American paratroopers that were stationed there together with certain other, I think the 26th Division, they held it out and we know what the story was there. But we were on the fringes of it. Okay, let me see where the battle would have been. Aachen, okay, we were, okay. We were stationed right here, just below Aachen, which is right here about 50 miles south of Aachen, and that, where the pen is, is the north shoulder of the bulge. In other words, it was like that. Mm. On the top V, top v, top uh, point of the arrowhead, in other words, mm -hmm. the top shoulder of the arrowhead, right there. And we were right in that, uh, right in that area. Yes, there's Balmany right below us, where that uh, very, very infamous slaughter took place. A hundred soldiers, American soldiers, were captured there, and they were. The story goes that they tried to escape, so the Germans mowed them down, every last one of them, with one exception, one survivor, and he's the one that escaped and told the rest of the Allies what the German that massacre had done at Normandy. Did you know about it at that time? Did you the word come no, out? No, no, not yet, Bob. What we you, did. You can you can sit down. I think you go. That's great. Thank you. What we did know was to watch out for German paratroopers who were dressed in American uniforms and that a lot of them spoke very good English and they were f infiltrating all around trying to find out American positions, American uh, supplies, American strategy and of course to do what damage they could to unsuspecting American soldiers because of tremendous confusion. I, I, I understand that even some had the, the M MP, you know, put the MP they all bands did. on and, they all did. and redirected traffic. A lot of them did that also. They, that's, they uh, redirected a lot of American reinforcements and sent them into a dead end so that they couldn't uh, assist the comrades that they were supposed to, that the Americans were supposed to assist. And, but we had a couple of them come uh, that we had to be very, very careful of because there's a lot of new soldiers that were being, it was like a big soup pot that was just constantly being stirred there. Our lines were not very stable, uh, Bob, and tremendous amount of confusion. Casualties, new reinforcements, reassignments, we didn't know who the hell was who, so we didn't know uh, who the hell to trust. So we had to watch out for these imposters, as they were, or fakes, as they were. Uh, one of the units nearby, they were able to tell the Germans only if uh, they ripped off his shirt and looked at his underwear. If it was German underwear, then he was a German. But <laughs> I, I understand that they also challenged with, like, you know, who's Babe Ruth and things like that. Well, that was perhaps on an extreme case, Bob, if they were very doubtful. And usually, uh, but if, a, if you got that close to a soldier, to a German soldier, and you had to challenge him, usually he would reveal uh, that he was uh, 
that he was a, uh, a, sol a German soldier before that. But uh, that was a little bit of, that wasn't too frequently done, but uh, you, if you did challenge a soldier that much, why, usually uh, it was a very, um, what's the word I'm trying to say, pretty well established by that time that he was a, uh, an enemy soldier. Because they shot him, I understand. When you found him, you didn't I don't think they did, Bob. Uh, they didn't find too many. Uh, they probably would at the time, but we didn't find any direct head-on like that to where we'd shoot them. The Americans were pretty good, and so were the Germans at taking prisoners of each side. They weren't too, except for that one massacre at Malmody. That was a, uh, that's a real huge debatable situation in, in American military history because the Americans say that the Germans deliberately mowed him down because they didn't want to bother with him and take time to treat them as prisoners because they didn't have the Germans didn't have enough manpower. That the Germans told us that a lot of Americans tried to escape and in the process of escaping they were inviting themselves to be shot just like if you're on the way from a prison guard he's going to shoot you. Yeah, but I but think uh, I think the investigation you know after then the after that Bob was. there was a lot of uh, very very thorough. And Investigation going on, which I'm not uh, completely uh, versed on. Yeah, well, the, the, the one that was responsible, uh, he was uh, he was not he was charged, but then they let him they let him out. And I think in 1950 something, last I heard. Okay, yes, and uh, his own German soldiers are the ones that uh, that identified him because the old regular German soldiers did not want to shoot American prisoners. American intelligence officers got this particular German group after they were captured, and they asked the soldiers which officer ordered the slaughter of the Malmody, and the German soldier said it was him. So they identified him. So yeah, they identified him. I think what finally happened is this one, I forget what, what the colonel or whatever he was. Yeah, Colonel Vaughn something. Or right. And uh, they finally killed him, but they uh, somebody got to him, you know. Uh, okay. Uh, Oh, that's right, in his house. They sneaked into his house several years later yeah. and, and uh, shot him in his own home. Right. I guess for out of revenge. Yeah, I think that's the way it wound up. I wasn't sure. Okay, now, okay, now the battle's over with and we have won. And uh, where were you at the, at the, when they surrendered? The, when the, the Germans the, surrendered? VE day. Where were you, VE Day? Right out of, the, right off the Elbe River, Bob. That would be right over in here. Have to that tent. Oh, here we are. Move over to the left a little bit, uh, Hugh. Okay. Well, after the Battle of the Bulge was over, Bob, we advanced and we hit uh, two more main obstacles. One was after we left our position at Hurtgen, where we had been for two months, more or less, we advanced in March because the snow began to melt and we could advance again, but it was very heavy mud, mud all over the place. The trucks were sinking the mud up to their hubcaps. We got to the Ruhr River and the Germans made a defense there. The Ruhr River was not very wide, but it was a very swift river, so it was very difficult to manufacture or to construct uh, bridges to cross there, pontoon bridges and so on. Well, we finally made that. That was in February, the middle of February. And then we got over into the Cologne River and the city of Cologne, the Rhine River, I mean. And there again, we uh, got stopped and slowed down for a while. That was called the Rhineland. And uh, finally we crossed that. And after we crossed the Rhineland, there was just no going, no stopping us until we got up into the Elbe River, where we met the Russians on May the 10th or thereabouts. And that ended it. That was VE Day. A couple of uh, few days uh, before that, Hitler had shot himself. Excuse me, committed suicide or something. And that was uh, the end of the war. And then we waited for two months or so to come home. And we were put on just big tra troop transports and came home. And I think, Bob, here are some pictures of, of uh, well, let's see. Uh, this was the Hurricane Forest. Here was the Elbe River. 
the end of uh, the war in Germany. Well, you were at the Elbe River then, huh? Yes, up at the northern part, right near Lake Schwerin. Did, this you, did you get to meet any of the Russians? Yep. Got pictures of them right here, Bob. Sure do. Here we are. There's a German airfield right near, right near uh, the Elbe River. The Germans destroyed their own planes when they could no longer uh, fly them so that we wouldn't get them. There was a big bunker here somewhere in the interior of Germany. And a German village here, German village here, American chow line. There's uh, General uh, giving us a great big pep talk here. There's the duplicates. There's the pillbox where we lived when we went up there to, to observe, do our forward observing. Broken Village. There was the Cologne plane uh, washing our guns down after it was muddy. Uh, cemetery near Liege. A lot of our casualties were Here's a now. Is this a, a cemetery or is yeah, that's it, a temporary cemetery? Temporary. Yes. Outside of the beach, Belgium. He's buried there. All of their guys have but, Cologne, there's that tower, of that famous cathedral, the Cologne Cathedral there. Uh, it's got a name, the whole building was blown down for the, 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 for the tower. from law. Say, uh, there's a sergeant giving me orders to There's a sniper up in the woods because somebody reported a sniper there. Five minutes after he gave me that order, an American truck comes running down the road, out of control, hits him and kills him. Is that right? Isn't that some Sergeant Axel line? There's uh, four 50 caliber machine guns, anti-aircraft. This is, I don't know who this is. It's, that must be me on the left, Bob. Truck driver. That's a cemetery. 
Here's our gun bob 105 howitzer with a net over it. We asked about the Elbe River. This is what we saw for 48 hours after the Germans surrendered. Just big troop movements in mass, just thousands and thousands of Germans surrendering, those old German soldiers after they'd thrown up their hands. And the war was over. In a battered village in somewhere around Cologne. This is uh, these are all duplicates, Bob. There I am again. Okay, well, we, oh, here's the airfield, which uh, these are German airplanes parked in there, but they couldn't get off the ground. I took all these pictures, Bob. Here's a big industrial center, the Krupp Works, uh, out of Cologne there. Big factories there where they manufactured all kinds of uh, war armaments. There's American tanks. Here we are in action, Bob. There's the German ME 109 parked in the forest for safety. They couldn't be seen and strafed. And uh, you saw this, you saw this. Here is where the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, we were up in these hillsides, Bob, and we finally had to take safety up there, and the Battle of the Bulge came out along here on that field down below. This is another part of it. It came right down that valley, Bob. There's a pontoon bridge. Here's a group of guys I was with in Normandy. Cubs. And here's our gun in action in the winter. Here it is again. And here's where we spent Christmas Eve, Bob, right there. And yeah, we'll take these pictures out there. Pictures are wilted, they're getting old. Can these be preserved somehow, Bob? Do you know? 